Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Today, I am so happy because I actually finally got somebody who was supposed to come on a few weeks ago, but I canceled on them because my dog was sick. And I'm so excited that we actually made it happen. So we have Alina fucking Lopez in the studio. Hi. And I'm so happy your dog is still okay. I know. I am so surprised, actually, that she is so... Like I told you when, you know, I canceled, I literally thought she'd had a stroke and we were like going to put her down. Yeah, Spiegel yeah. called me. And- yeah, I was like about to, I was like about to cry. I'm glad you did not have to put her down. <laughs> yeah. So it turns out she had vestibular disease, which is not all that uncommon in old dogs. And it just... Essentially, what the vet said was for her is that the whole world was spinning. She had like vertigo. Yeah, like severe vertigo. Mm-hmm. So she couldn't stand up. She kept falling over. She was nauseous. Oh, she was drooling. Baby. Yeah, and it was really sad. But he said it actually like kind of goes <clears throat> away on its own. Um, you don't have to give her any medication. Or we did give her a medication for the nausea mm-hmm. to help her with that, um, so that like she could eat. But um, in terms of the actual like spinning and the vertigo, I guess there's not really anything you can do. Mm-hmm. You just have to like let it. And I don't, they don't, apparently vets don't really understand it. Um, what even causes that? It's just, it's like an imbalance in, you know, the whatever part of your brain, like between your ears that like helps us, you know, differentiate, I think between left and right and balance. Mm. It, that gets fucked up. I don't know. Damn. I don't know exactly. I am I am not a vet. <laughs> I am not that smart. Um, but she still walks with like a slightly tilted. She kind of goes this oh. way a little bit, but she's she's walking. And, it's like sad, but kind of cute. Yeah. <laughs> and she's in good spirits and, you know, she still tries to play fetch and she's eating and stuff. So, so we're happy. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. So, but anyways, anyways, I'm so glad that we can make this happen again. Cause I know I'm you're a crazy busy girl. <laughs> Spiegler said you were booked up until out until next year. So yeah, it's, nice. it's been a, it's been a busy year. For yeah. Sure. <laughs> and it's your two year anniversary, right? Yeah. This month is my two year anniversary in porn. Wow. And you got the cover of AVN magazine. I did. Which is very exciting. Yeah. It was a huge surprise and like such awesome timing. Yeah. Something to be able to, it was awesome to be able to do such a big project like that on my two year anniversary. Yeah. So how has like the last two years been for you? Kind of take us through like how you got here and how you. It has been crazy. It has gone, it has far surpassed the best case scenario that I had imagined when I first got in. Mm -hmm. Um, I, when I first got in the industry, I knew that, you know, the average career length of a new girl is, can be even as short as six months. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had no idea what was going to happen to me. I knew I was going to come in and and give it my all, but you know, sometimes things just don't work out. And I had kind of just planned to just try and be in for a year to two years and Mm -hmm. hoping that I would at least make it that long. Mm -hmm. Um, and here I am at two years and, you know, like Spiegler said, I'm getting booked into next year. So it's, it's amazing. I, I'd never imagined, I hoped, you know, making it to two years was, was my goal. Right. And like I said, I've even surpassed that now and it's just, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you get into the industry? Um, I was always curious about sex work, um, from a, uh, from a young age, even <laughs> I yeah. was curious about it and, and drawn to it. Um, and, my plan kind of was to start, you know, when I was 18, when I was younger, I just wanted to do it right away. Like I was looking into stripping and camming and, you know, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, but, um, and then when I turned 18, I ended up actually getting a job that I really loved, uh, outside of sex work. So I kind of put it on hold for a minute. And then when I was 22, I finally felt ready. And I, you know, I felt like it was, it was time to kind of take the plunge. And I'm glad I didn't start when I was 18. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of girls start when they're 18 and they're fine. Um, I think I had a little bit more maturing to do and I wanted to make sure I was really making the right choice because, you know, once it's out there, you can never take it back. Mm -hmm. So when I was 22, I I felt a lot more confident and, um, and ready for it. And I, and I took the plunge and I'm glad that I did because I'm not sure things would have gone as well as they did if I had started earlier. Yeah. Why do you think that well, why do you think that you didn't start when you were 18? Was it just because this other job came up and, and that took, do you think that if that job had not happened that you would have started in the industry at 18? Yeah. I think that if that job wouldn't happen, I, I definitely would have started earlier. Um, so why do you think it's better that you started later? Um, 
I mean, the job that I had, I, I was working um, at a school for troubled youth mm -hmm. and I really, really loved it. I worked with special needs kids all through high school um, and at the school uh, for troubled youth, there was girls there that were struggling with mental health issues and some, you know, some that weren't, but it was just a really good growing experience for me. Um, and I really enjoyed working with them and I feel like it helped me grow up a lot, you know, and probably tell you a lot of compassion and patience. Yeah. And, and, and understanding of people because, you know, you know, some of these girls, would act out and, you know, then you kind of learn more about where they came from before they were at the school and you understand them better and you understand mm -hmm. why people do things that they do. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of teaches you not to judge people on, you know, their yeah. actions and stuff. And that was especially helpful coming into the industry when yeah. people here can, you know, sometimes act out in ways that you don't understand. I mean, people everywhere, but yeah. You know, this industry can be especially stressful at times. I think especially because, you know, it's such an, you know, becoming a, getting into porn, you can so easily be, as you know, be quickly rocketed to fame and notoriety online. And so when you're dealing with these mental health issues and you're, you know, having these situations where you're essentially figuring out how to deal with life and you're making mistakes as we all do and overreacting and behaving badly as we all do in our youth. It's being played out on this p very public stage mm -hmm. for, you know, thousands and thousands, sometimes millions of people to watch. Mm -hmm. And I think that can be really, really difficult for young people. Yeah. So, I mean, taking what I learned from that job <clears throat> and using some of those skills and maneuvering the industry now has been extremely helpful. Mm hmm what do you think that, um, what do you think are some of the things that you do now at your age that maybe you wouldn't have before? Do you think that you're better like establishing boundaries? Oh, for sure. Um, you know, I was, I definitely feel, you know, those few short years between being 18 and 22, you grow a lot. You do. Yeah. A lot from, of people don't realize that. And yeah. The problem is, is when you're 18, you think you know everything. Mm -hmm. You really do. And, and I, I was confident even then, um, but I I had no experience in, in the adult world. And I mm -hmm. think that, you know, some of these girls that come into porn straight out of high school, they've, a lot of them have never worked a real job. They've never had a boss. They've had, they've never had hours of schedule. And they think that porn is just like, you know. A big party. A big party, yeah. yeah. And they don't understand. You need to be on time to your call times. You need to respect your boss. You need to respect your directors, mm -hmm. your agent, your coworkers. You know, it, this is work. Yeah. This is a business. Um, and I feel like those skills that I learned working a full-time job um, outside of porn before coming in helped me uh, take it more seriously as a job once I got in and respect other people's time, you know, and not just showing up two hours late to set or, you know, yeah. unless there's terrible traffic like there was the day we shot together. <laughs> That's okay. You and the entire crew were all, like, equally late. So it's oh totally fine. That it's was totally crazy. But, um, and we ended up, like, you know, not going overtime anyway. So yeah. we were totally okay. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that you, that you bring up that point specifically about how if you come into this industry really young and you haven't had – a regular kind of nine to five job or a job where you're working with other people, how that can affect your job performance and how seriously you take your job and your behavior and stuff like that, because that's so incredibly true. Mm -hmm. And I've actually, you know, most people, when they argue for the idea of starting porn later, it's usually like, oh, well, you're just not grown up yet. You haven't developed well, your brain. That's not and to say that some 18 year olds I get in the industry right. can't or aren't successful. Right. Um, I mean, there's, 30 year olds that get in the industry and, and are Can't, idiots. Don't and, yeah, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. But so I think true. it's still definitely, it's never going to hurt you to mm -hmm. wait. Right. Because it's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. But I think the 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 point that you brought up with the the idea of actually having worked in a more strict because porn is it's structured it's not as structured as like a regular nine to five is, you know? Mm -hmm. It's it's very different. The hours can be all over the place. Every production set's different. Mm -hmm. Your boss is a different person every single day and they have mm -hmm. different rules and mm -hmm. they have different behaviors or working with different people. Um but I think it what you said is really valuable about, you know, how people would fare better if they've had a 
regular, more structured job where they've kind of learned those skills. Absolutely. About being every every girl in the industry that I know who has had a a career before mm-hmm. porn um, has – it shows. Yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> it yeah, shows yeah. in their professionalism. It shows in – you know, and how they behave on set and how mm-hmm. they how they act towards their co stars, it, mm-hmm. it it shows. You can tell. Yeah. So okay, so I kind of interrupted you. We went off on a little bit of a tangent. So <laughs> you, um, okay, so you were older and you decided that you wanted to try sex work. So what was the first thing that you did? Um, <clears throat> well, I I went to a few strip clubs mm-hmm. just to see, you know. I went to my first strip club when I was like maybe 19 Mm -hmm. just to see what that is like. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was fun and I enjoyed it, but I, it didn't seem like enough money to me. Mm -hmm. Um, And you had a background in dance, right? Yeah. I was, well, I was a gymnast mostly. That's my, my biggest defining, you know, sport that I did growing up. I was a competitive gymnast for like 10 years. Wow. And then after that, uh, I did dance and cheer. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so I, I looked into stripping and to me, it just, it didn't seem like, uh, quite what I was looking for. Um, and I looked into camming briefly, but that's, I wanted to get out of the house more and travel more. And camming is definitely not going to get you out of the house. Yeah. <laughs> so I you ne- literally never have to leave your bedroom. Yeah. And, and I just liked that. And, you know, with camming and stripping, the money you make, is going to be different, you know, every night. I, Mm -hmm. what I liked about porn was that it's, you know, you have a set rate and you know, you're going to make that, you know, it's, it's more to me, it seemed more, you know, reliable, I guess, or more consistent. That's true. Um, so I started researching agents. I literally, I didn't know where to start because I didn't know a single person in the industry. I didn't know anyone or anything. I had zero connections. Um, so the first thing I did was just Google porn agents. And I, I live in Southern Utah. Um, so I'd looked, I, I knew there probably wasn't going to be any in Utah. Right. So I looked porn, I Googled porn agents, Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. And that's what I, cause it's close to where I live. Right. Um, and a couple came up and I, you know, I'm not an idiot. I looked at a f- couple websites and by the websites alone, I was like, okay, this is not something maybe these agents are not mm-hmm. the one for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, um, I came across a couple that looked okay to me and, you know, and I looked at their girls. I'm like, okay, is this like a site that I want to be up, you know, on there with? Yeah, their roster says a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So I looked at the rosters and and looked to to see if I would fit in with them or, you know, if all the girls were like covered in tattoos and piercings and Mm -hmm. stuff. I'm like, okay, this is maybe a more alternative agency, you know, Mm -hmm. kind of just looking for the right one. And I spent months looking at agents before I even made my first phone call. Mm -hmm. Um. And I, I found Spiegler. Well, I before I found him, I was still struggling to find a like a, a website and an agent that looked good to me. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, well, what about like the top girls in the industry? So I started looking up like you know the most the most famous porn stars, you know, like Riley and and Angela and <clears throat> and uh, some of those girls. And I realized I'm like, okay, well, who represents them? And it was Spiegler. Mm. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to, and I like read, I Googled everything about him. I wow. read like every article I could find. I watched every interview. Like I, you really did your research. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I spent a long time on this. Um, and I read that he only, you know, he's super exclusive. He only represents 25 to 30 girls at a time. Mm-hmm. And, and I looked at his website and it was full. And then, and also to just, by the way, really quickly, I just want to laugh a little bit at how you said, like, you know, you look at people's website and you use that to like judge because his Spiegler, website I is fucking really outdated. love you, but your website sucks. <laughs> and I think that it's I, so outdated. It looks like it was like done in like 1995. Yeah, I, he likes it. He says that he, he wants to keep it like the original. He's like, well, I haven't had anyone not book. You know, any of the girls. Well, that's the thing. It. It's like Spiegler. It's so funny because he's like his own kind of entity where like he's so popular. He's, you know, considered the best agent mm-hmm. by so many people. He has the best girls. You know, as a producer, he's like my go-to guy. You know, he's just fantastic. He's honest. He's direct. He will always get back to you right mm-hmm. away. But his fucking website yeah. sucks. I, but I feel like I get it. Like he doesn't need to change his website. Spiegler doesn't have to do shit. Like yeah. he will never lack for girls mm-hmm. and work. 
So it's completely unnecessary, but part of me still wishes he would do it. I think that honestly, while I was looking up websites, I did come across his and I put it to the side. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't until later because I remember like reading about him and like going to his website. I'm like, wait, I think I already looked at this one yeah. and said no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, a couple days later, I looked again and he had one spot open up. I noticed that he, he must have dropped a girl. Mm-hmm. And I literally just, he had a phone number on his website and I just called on my lunch break while wow. I was at my nine to five. Wow. And I went outside and I called and I'm like looking around, making sure none of my coworkers are coming outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he, and he answered and he was in the shower. Of course, he always <laughs> answers his phone. He never doesn't answer his phone. And I was expecting to get like an assistant or something. And then it's just hear this like, hello. Like, and it was angry hilarious speak too. Voice. Angry speak their voice with like water yeah, in the back. And I was you're like, so confused. I was like, did I call the right number? You're like, like, what are is you this? in the shower? No, I didn't say that, but he did. He's like, I was like, Hey, uh, my name is, you know, and, and I, uh, I'm trying to get into the industry. Um, I, are you taking any girls right now? And he was like, oh, well, I'm in the shower. Let me call you back. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so he, you must have hung up and been like, what I was the so, fuck I literally looked on? at his website and looked at the number. I just called him like, was that the right number? Because <laughs> I was so confused. <clears throat> but now that I know Spiegler, that's yeah. just him. He, yeah, 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 totally. He will never not answer the phone. Like, yes. it doesn't matter. Um, so, yeah, he called me back later and... Um, he was like, okay, he was, he's so to the point, like he's, oh, yeah. he's, he's a busy guy. He doesn't waste any time. He wasn't fucking around. Like I, um, he was like, okay, well, do you have anywhere I can see pictures of you? And I, and at that time I was doing more like mainstream modeling and mm-hmm. I had a modeling Instagram, Instagram account, like mm-hmm. not porn related. And I was like, yeah, I have a, I have an Instagram you can look at. And he's like, well, what is it? I'll look at it right now. And I was like, oh shit. He's like going to look me, look yeah, me up right like, now. While we're on the phone. Yeah. So I'm like, this, he could just say like, fuck off and hang up. You yeah. know, like I was so nervous. My heart started racing. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, yeah, you're, you're cute. When can you come out? And I was like, uh, and I didn't even like, I had to get work off and I was like, I have no idea. I just called you. Like, yeah. I don't know. so then I went back in and I had to schedule a, a week off of work and drove out to LA. Um, and I shot my first scene. What was um, it like meeting him? I, uh, well, at that point I knew he was someone, you know, not to be messed with. I knew he was someone high up in the industry and, and I was nervous. I, mm-hmm. I really was. And I, I pretty much at that point decided if this guy is not going to represent me, I probably am just not going to do porn. So he didn't agree to represent you before you drove out to LA, right? He, it, he made it sound he, like, like a trial. Like yeah, he wanted to meet me in person, he, yeah. but he booked my first scene before meeting me. Oh, wow. So I had it booked. Like, you know, he talked to me a few times on the phone okay. and he had a fuck ton of photos of me and video. I'd sent, I, cause I'd done video projects too, like uh-huh. not porn, but like, just like, you know, modeling videos. Um, so he knew what I looked like, like, you know, he knew I wasn't like catfishing him or something. Right. But like, did he, cause I know that he's also very particular about who he hires. Cause you can't, you need to not only be good looking, but you also have to be like professional, serious well, he, at the job, yeah, but he, pervert, he, like all he those took things. me through all those tests. He asked me, he's like, well, well, what do you, you know, sexually, like, what do you like? And I was like, well, I, I'm, I'm bisexual. I like men. I like women. I, I love like new experiences. Like I, you know, was the school slut in high school. Mm-hmm. I, you know, and he, so he knew I was, you know, a very sexual person. Okay. And he also, we had multiple phone calls before I ever drove out or he booked me, which were all scheduled. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of him testing my professionalism, mm-hmm. I'm sure, which is funny because we were in different time zones. So the first time I called him, I was by his clock an hour late. Mm-hmm. And I, cause he's like, call me at, at 8 PM tomorrow. Yeah. And I called him at 8 PM tomorrow. And he's like, well, you were supposed to call me an hour ago. I'm like, it's 8 PM. And he's like, um, it, so that was funny, yeah. a funny mix up. Cause he thought I was calling him an hour late, but right. it was just different time zones. So he, he knew I was, and I, and I worked a nine to five and he knew that. Mm-hmm. So I think he kind of just trusted my professionalism based off of me having a normal job at the time and never being late you know, to our scheduled phone conversations, phone conversations right. and, and yeah. And so that was it. And he booked me work and I drove out and met him and shot my first scene. And, and it was pretty much just, I quit my job like two weeks later and just, that was it. What was your first scene? Uh, it was for Lansky. It was for Black Draw. Oh, wow. Yeah. That was your first scene. <laughs> wow. How was that? It was because there did they did he shoot them in hotel rooms? Uh, no, that was shot at a home. Okay. Um, 
I, yeah, they do shoot in hotel rooms a lot for that particular site. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this one was shot in a home. Uh, and he told me, he's like, now, like, not all porn companies are going to be like this because Lansky's, you know, days on a Lansky set is definitely very, like, um, long and structured and, you know, there's time frames that need to be met and, you know, it's just, it's very professional and, um, you know, so, and he was like, not, not all porn companies are going to be like this, you know, like long, long days like this and all that, but, but it was great. Everyone was really nice and it was, uh, my heart was just racing the whole day. But like, as soon as the camera started rolling and like, yeah, uh, Jason Love pulled out his dick and I started sucking it. It all went away. And I was just like, this is where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> like, it, it just awesome. came to me. I just, I just like did what I do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, and I love being before porn. Um, I, I love being on camera. Mm-hmm. Like I love modeling and I, uh, used to go on a video chat website. That's not even meant for porn. In fact, if they catch you like naked or anything, they kick you off. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just like a video chat website where you get assigned like random people to like video chat with from all over the world. It's supposed to be this like sweet thing that brings the world together to video mm-hmm. chat. And I just, people use it to like jerk off. Mm-hmm. So, and I was one of those people. So yeah. I would go on there and like masturbate and like have people watch me masturbate. Like I loved it. Wow. So, so you knew I, it was right for you. I did that for a long time and I was like, why am I like not getting paid for this? Like I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's why I thought about doing camming because I enjoyed that, that specific scenario right. so much. Yeah. Um, that's the thing about porn. It's like it can't be just for the money. Mm-hmm. Like you have to enjoy the work. You mm-hmm. have to enjoy being an exhibitionist. You mm-hmm. have to enjoy the sex. Otherwise, the money's never going to be enough. Yeah. And and I'm one of those people like I'll be on set and, you know, I've everyone on everyone should be professional on set, like talent and crew. Mm-hmm. And but I'm one of those people where I'm like, well, I'm like working and having sex I want everyone in the room to be like horny too like if I look over and a PA has a boner I'm like yeah that's hot like (laughs) so that that's great that's interesting because actually like a lot of times um girls would be like creeped out by that yeah and I said that yeah I said that to I was talking about it to Brie Mills and she was like I'm the one like saying no everyone be professional yeah no like if everyone was like if like if the director was filming and like jerking off that would be ideal to me that would make it more fun (laughs) can I tell you like the funniest story that just reminded me so when we shot your treat of the month shoot, mm-hmm. you know, the guy that was doing the steady cam. Yeah. So he like only works mainstream. <clears throat> like he mm-hmm. never, ever, ever works an adult and he only shoots the tease stuff. He never shoots any of like the masturbation. Did he shoot it that day? Oh. No, he never does. He oh. left. He oh, left yeah, early. I think I remember. He yeah. left early because when he, and he's still like kind of new to it because he's only ever worked for me and he's only, you know, done, he only does treat of the month stuff. Mm-hmm. Like I said, only the tease stuff. Um, and when he was leaving, cause he was leaving early, you were naked cause you're about to do the masturbation mm-hmm. and you ran up to him and gave him this hug naked, not <laughs> thinking about it. And I, of course, like to me, like that, whatever, it's I don't, normal. it's normal. Yeah. And I just remember his face to be like over your shoulder was like, Oh my, like he was like, he wasn't like. <laughs> freaked out but he yeah. was kind of he was so shocked taken aback he was so taken I aback. remember this I remember like teasing him like oh you're leaving before the show like, yeah, stay. yeah. <laughs> it was hilarious <laughs> and just a look on his face he was just like oh my god and I was like laughing I'm like I keep forgetting that you're not really part of this world oh, and god. this is different for you I hope I didn't make him feel uncomfortable no 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 no. he like no we laugh about it good. we laugh about it because I still <clears throat> he still works with me on all all those shoots and he told no he thought you were great honestly like he was everyone really, was great that day that was that was such a good day. That was such a good day. That mm-hmm. was definitely one of the best treat of the month shoots I've ever done. I'm, I love to hear you say that because I, I, I mean, it was the only treat of the month I've done. Yeah. <laughs> but it was one of my favorite shoots I've ever done by yeah. far. It was epic. It was so, so good. Um. So, okay. So you, so your first scene was with Black Draw mm-hmm. and then did you just start working like all the time? Yeah. So, well, I mean. That's the short version of that story. The long version is that I had a whole week of work booked that mm-hmm. week. Lansky had booked me for uh, three shoots that week. Mm-hmm. And I shot the first one and I started to feel kind of sick like halfway through, like mm-hmm. kind of like a headache. And mm-hmm. I ended up getting like 
terrible flu. Like I oh, was so no. sick. So I had to cancel those two scenes. And I, I was staying with Spiegler. Yeah. And I was so fucking sick. He took he took me to urgent care. Like he, <clears throat> I just met this guy. Yeah. And he's like taking care of me. And I feel like that bonded us so much, at least me to him. Yeah. I don't know how, if he even gives a fuck, but I was like <laughs> so grateful to him because I had to cancel. Here I am making my first impression on, on Spiegler. Yeah. Canceling my first, you know, Two of my first scenes. It's almost better that you were sick at his house so he could see that you were violently oh, yeah. ill and I was, you weren't faking oh, it. Oh, I was so, so sick. And I was so sick I couldn't even drive home. Mm-hmm. So I'm at his house for a week, not working, wow. sleeping in his guest bedroom because I couldn't even drive home. And I left and I we hadn't really, we he hadn't booked me any work after that at that mm-hmm. point. And he it kind of like, you know, at, at the end of the week, I'm like, okay, I'm feeling good enough to go. Like, thank you for everything. And I kind of left and I was like, all right, that was it. I just blew it. Like, yeah. I thought for sure. And then he called me a couple days later. He's like, hey, I need a schedule from you on like for sure days. People want to book you. Like, what do I, what days are you open? And I was like, oh, okay. So this is happening. Like, yeah. You know, I thought for sure it just, you know, that I blew it just from having to cancel two of my first scenes. Um, So from there, I... Uh, you know, I told him that it was important to me to be able to stay in Utah um, and have time with my family, which mm-hmm. is really important to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I made a commitment to come out every other week at that point, mm-hmm. uh, which has now changed to every two weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and I quit my job and now I just come out every two weeks and work. So and pretty much from that day, I've been booked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is it kind of, do you feel that this, the fact that you live somewhere else and that you have a whole other life outside of porn and you have a whole other like social circle outside of porn, do you feel that that's almost healthier for you in a way and can create that distinction between the two? Because I feel like sometimes people come into this industry and they get so wrapped up in the industry and their whole life it consumes them. is the I, industry. I think it is an absolute necessity to have a life outside of porn. I mean, I love porn and I'm, I'm so happy to have it, but this is, this is not a lifestyle and Mm -hmm. it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I come here and I work and I shoot and, um, I have people in the industry that I love and that I'm close to and that I'm grateful to have. Um, but I have an entire life outside Mm -hmm. of LA. Yeah. Um, this is work, you know, I come to work and I go home Right. and I feel like a lot of people here never stop with Mm -hmm. it. And I do not think it's healthy. Um, I, I think that it's really important to have a life outside of work in any industry. Yeah. You know, I was say. it's, it's not just porn. I mean, there's people outside of porn that are, that are workaholics and they never leave the office. They only hang out people from work and it, it, it'll drive you crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like I have a really good balance and I'm, and I'm lucky to have that. And, you know, I have a really supportive family and a uh, really accepting family and, and I have friends and, you know, Utah is, I, I come here and I work and I'm Alina Lopez and I go home to Utah and, I, and I'm just me mm-hmm. and I don't do any porn stuff. I don't work. I just, I spend time with my family and I focus on me and I work on my personal life and, and it's just wonderful. Yeah. I would n- never want to change it. Even like, even if I am losing work by being out there, it's a sacrifice I'm definitely happy to make. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like when you come back, you're completely booked anyways. So I feel like it just it just kind of forces you to have that separation mm-hmm. and to kind of schedule out your life better. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I've been in the industry for 21 years. And even though like I kind of grew up in it because my you know mom worked in it, I definitely have like a life outside of it. Like my boyfriend's not connected to the adult industry at all. A lot of my friends um, do not work in the adult industry. And I find that that's very healthy Mm -hmm. for me. You know, Um, so many people are so consumed. And, you know, it happens sometimes when like work turns on you. And then these people like. And if all you have are work, are friends yeah. in the industry, then if and when you have a falling out, then now you have to work with these people. Right. <laughs> or it's going to affect, you know, it's just safer. I mean, I definitely have friends, mm-hmm. friends in the industry. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, it's important to have a healthy social circle mm-hmm. outside of work. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I think that that's really, 
I think that's really valuable. And I think you're very smart to do that. Thanks. <laughs> okay. So we're going to take a quick commercial break and then when we come back. We're going to talk about um, your Mormon upbringing, some really cool new projects that you're doing that are coming out that are actually out now and um, so much more. So hang tight guys. We'll be right back. Are you a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered? Of course you are. Well, I need your help to keep this show going. This is why I've set up a Patreon account where you can donate to support my show. And in exchange, you can be eligible for all kinds of cool, fun perks and prizes, which include autographed DVDs and books. See, you guys, she's actually signing shit. Free membership passwords to my website, hollyrandall.com. Free mugs, pens, shirts, bags, all kinds of really cool stuff. So take care of me and I will take care of you. I will not only be able to continue to produce this podcast with really awesome, inspiring content about your favorite adult stars, but I will also give back to you in terms of all the cool, fun perks and prizes that we offer. So please, please support me at patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered. And thank you guys so much for your support. I could not do this without you. Okay, so we're back. So Alina, I know this is something that you've talked about a lot, but you know, people are always fascinated by this and the duality and the fact that you do have a good relationship with your family. So you grew up Mormon, Mm -hmm. which is notoriously, um, I wouldn't say provides a lot of sex education. None. (laughs) (laughs) The only sex education they provide is don't do it. Yeah. So how, how was that for you and how did getting into sex work coming from that kind of background work? Um, you know, there's a lot, there's actually a few other girls in the industry who were raised Mormon and and I feel like I had a, a mostly different experience from, from the girls that I know that were raised Mormon, because for me, I never really believed in the Mormon church, even Mm -hmm. when I was young. And it was my whole life, Mm -hmm. my whole family, my whole neighborhood. We, you know, Mormon people kind of live in Mormon populated areas, Mm -hmm. Um, and so all my neighbors, all my friends at school, everyone around me was, and yet I, I always knew that I didn't believe even when I was young, I Mm -hmm. never, you know, so for me, it wasn't that hard to leave the Mormon church because I never felt connected to it anyways. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that it was, it was best that way too, because then when I finally did really fully you know, leave the church, my family wasn't shocked. They all, everyone else kind of knew too. Yeah. My parents always tried to push me into it when I was younger. Um, but I think they always knew that it just, it, it wasn't for me. Right. Um, so I didn't have like some big dramatic exit and, you know, my family didn't disown me because they knew that I, that it's, um, it's, it's not going to work for me. Right. If, you know, they don't want, me in their life, then that's on them. Right. Um, so, but anyways, what was the, (laughs) the the other part of the question? Well, I was going to ask you, so how, how did they react when they found out that you were doing adult work? It wasn't a huge surprise to a lot of them. I was always a really, you know, I don't really feel like I ever went through like an awkward phase. Mm -hmm. I've always been pretty confident. Even Mm -hmm. when I was younger, I, and I was always very sexual, you know, I've been masturbating my whole life and, and, um, I've always been a huge flirt. I was always like getting in trouble at school and in church for flirting and talking and lifting up my skirt and all those things. <laughs> like, and I, I just thought it, I had so much fun mm-hmm. doing that, those things, you mm-hmm. know, and I just genuinely loved being openly sexual not even just keeping it a secret and just like masturbating at home. Mm-hmm. Like I would, you know, I love dressing sexy. I love tying up my shirt and dancing to Britney Spears music and, mm-hmm. you know, and I just, I didn't just enjoy my sexuality. I, I enjoyed sharing it mm-hmm. and being open about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my family and, and they, they just always knew that they always saw they There was nothing they could do to stop me from doing those things. Um, And there's seven kids in my family. So when there's that many kids, it's hard to like, you know, give one kid who's struggling in their eyes that kind of attention to get them to stop doing that if you really want them to, because there's just too much going on. Right. So, I mean, I guess I kind of worked in my advantage because I got to get away with those things a lot more. (laughs) 
Um, but when I when I finally started, um, well, before I even was in the industry, I was in a in a serious relationship, and we were open. Mm-hmm. And my family, who all knew that I was in an open relationship, so mm-hmm. that was very like shocking to them. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so they knew I was like doing things out of the ordinary sexually already. So I did all these little things from growing up into adulthood to get them kind of used to me being sexually. You were preparing them all along. I guess so. Yeah. Unintentionally preparing them to, for what, for the big finale. (laughs) Uh, So when I finally did porn, I think the biggest, uh, response from the people in my life were just that they weren't surprised. Right. And not even, and my cousin, when she found out, she said it in the funniest way. Um, she, she calls me and I hadn't really told a lot of people myself, like a lot of people just found out on their own, um, which I wasn't afraid of it. Cause like Spiegler warned me, he's like, everyone, you know, is going to find out. I'm like, okay, like, I don't care. Yeah. Um, so my cousin called me and she was like, Hey, so I saw something, you know, online or someone told me and, and she was like, not to be rude, but I'm not surprised. Like, and I, and she wasn't that, saying that in, a, in an offensive way. Like, yeah. oh, I'm not surprised. Yeah. She was genuinely saying like, yeah, like that's like, sounds like something you would do. And that's right. great. Like, right, right, right. And it just, it just cracked me up. But yeah, so my family was pretty, it wasn't like a big emotional thing. Mm. It wasn't like a big crazy thing. And like no one even, there was no point where anyone in my family like didn't talk to me for a short period of time. Like everything just kind of went on as normal. So you're so close to your family and you guys all. Yeah, have we're all having Thanksgiving together in a couple of weeks. Like That's great. Yeah. See, I love hearing stories like that because so many people, and actually I got a comment on one of my YouTube videos literally the other day from some guys saying this, that, you know, can you... F- you know, all these girls come from broken homes. All these girls, all come these girls from, were abused. All these girls were abused. Um, you know, every mm-hmm. single one of them. And that's why they do porn. And I try to tell people like, that's not the case. Like, yes, some people have experienced mm-hmm. that. Look, a lot of people have experienced abuse. Yeah. In I'm general. like, do you realize that? And pretty much every girl was sexually abused. I don't know anyone who wasn't. It's honestly. happened to a lot of people. Yeah. And a lot of people didn't go into porn. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, unfortunately, it's something that's across the board. It's happened to a lot of people. But of course, the focus is always on the people who work in porn because mm-hmm. you're like, oh, of course, that that's what would have happened. But what it sounds like to me with you and I remember like Angela White had a very similar story as well is that you were just always a sexual person mm-hmm. and it was something that you know, you had from a young age and it wasn't the result of abuse and it wasn't the result of, you know, some horrible circumstance. It was just who you were. Mm. And, you know, you were able to find an industry that supported that and also paid you for it, Mm -hmm. that you could like make a career out of it. So when you hear people talk about, you know, how every girl who works in porn comes from this broken, abusive family you must kind of like roll your eyes yeah, because I, obviously you're the antithesis of that. Yeah. I, my family was was great growing up. I mean, like, even though we were Mormon, we weren't, you know, there's different, I feel like different levels of Mormonism mm-hmm. in, the, in the sense of how how devoted some families are compared to others. My family was, de- was definitely all devoted, but like even all the women in my family are very sexual, mm. um, even if they're all monogamous or waited till marriage, like, you know even my Mormon sisters have like baskets of lingerie and sex toys. Like the, and, yeah. and my mom, you know, was always, my mom is Latin and, and she's very sexual. And she, although like she waited till marriage and, you know, my dad was the only man she'd ever been with growing up. Uh, she was dancing around the kitchen in her underwear too. Like mm-hmm. I just grew up and like all the women in my family are really sexual. And, and, you know, my mom came to AVN Oh, and she's awesome. right now she's sewing my dress like hand like from scratch for next really? year's AVN. Yeah. Oh my god, that's so great. And she's like super like supportive. And you know, she came to AVN and she was like so she's really competitive. She was a, a gymna- gymnastics mom, a cheer mom. So she's all like, <laughs> you know, I told her what I was nominated for and and uh, and I was up for best new starlet and she was looking at all the other girls who nominated. She's like, Well, 
you're the prettiest one. And you're like, oh, and I'm like, stop. mom, stop. Like, she was so, so competitive. And she's like, show me which ones are, are those girls or, you know, yeah. she's just like, she's there and she's all for it. Like, yeah, that's almost like, too much. That sounds like my mom. My mom's also very competitive and super supportive too. Yeah. That's she so just funny. wants, you know, she just wants us to be happy and wants us to be smart and safe mm-hmm. and all that. And she also wants us to just, whatever we're going to do, you know, do it the best we can. Right. So if I'm going to commit to this, I'm not going to half-ass it. Right. And she supports me in that. And right. she respects me in that because I've shown her, you know, when I told her that I um, that I was doing porn, you know, at first she, it was shocking to her and she didn't really, I could tell she didn't really know how to feel. Um, and I, and I went and I got a few of my box covers and, and my penthouse had, had come out at Mm -hmm. that point and, and hustler and taboo that I I was on the cover of all these things. And I was like, look, like I did all this within my first year. Right. And, and I I told her what AVN was. And then I, at that point I had five nominations and, Mm -hmm. and she was like, wow. Like she actually, and she like looked at my penthouse and she's like, can I keep one of these? (laughs) Like she, so so she kept it. Yeah. And she, she's, she's proud of me. She really is. Yeah. She still goes to church every Sunday and she's still proud of me. Yeah. I mean, you know, it just goes to show that, you know, a life of being religious and, you know, having a sex worker in the family doesn't have to be Mm -hmm. something that can I know. I'm like, I hate to break it to you guys, but guess what? My mom is proud of me. She does love me because people are always like, oh, your parents must be proud. Like, yeah, uh, actually. Yeah. Yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my mom's going with Like, I'm so end. sorry. It must just like crush your soul that my family accepts me. Like, you're going to have to find something else to hate on. <laughs> yeah. It's sad, right? Because people always, well, you know, it's always people that are projecting their own sexual mm-hmm. hangups and insecurities mm-hmm. on other people, you know. I'm like, why? Does your mom hate you? Like, right. what is the issue here? <laughs> I think one of the biggest issues that, you know, human beings have is that we always project our own experiences and our own feelings onto other people. Mm-hmm. And we think, well, you must be this kind of person or you must feel this way about this because I would feel that way if I was in that situation because I had these experiences and my life was like this. So therefore you must feel the same way. And like what a small minded way to to perceive the world. Right. (laughs) Exactly. Without recognizing that we are all different and Mm -hmm. we are all like Mm -hmm. the makeup of our, you know, biology and our hormones Mm -hmm. and our thoughts and our life experiences and our genetics. Like there's so many little Mm -hmm. things that go into making each person an individual human being and all of, you know, your experiences are your own experiences. Mm-hmm. And and why can't you just be happy for people if they're happy? I know. Why is that such a hard concept for people to grasp? I think it's because <laughs> they're so incredibly unhappy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I always try to look at people who, you know, come at, troll people online and it's, feel this negativity. The psychology behind it is so interesting, actually. Mm-hmm. Every time I get one of those really nasty comments um, from someone on social media, Sometimes I'll go look at their profile yeah. and you can see how miserable they are. Yeah. You can see there was one guy who posted something and I looked and he had he had commented on, you know, 30 other girls posts saying mm-hmm. nasty things as well yeah. within the last like hour. Yeah. And I was like, you're just sitting on your computer just but boiling and and being so angry and nasty, I'm like, you need to like turn off your computer and get outside. Like you, you need help. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's actually very concerning. Like, I'm like, I don't, I'm not hurt by people when they comment those things. I, I mostly feel sad for them mm-hmm. and yeah. concerned. Yeah. I think that's very, um, it's a very valid way to feel. <laughs> So uh, you have um, a couple of new things that have just come out. Um, So today is technically Halloween. When this podcast actually comes out on the platforms, it it will not be Halloween anymore. (laughs) But um, so you just had a movie called Fertile come out from Pure Taboo, Mm -hmm. right? So can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I saw some of the box covers, Mm -hmm. some of the artwork around it. It looks like super fucking creepy, which is... (laughs) You know, it's like Halloween. what? It's gotta yeah, be. but and also too, taboo. like that is so pure taboo and Brie Mills because and Halloween. If you mix it up, if yeah. you give her any reason to make it extra creepy for pure taboo, like Halloween is. It the must be like Brie's like favorite time of year. She's like now she's I can such be, a like, weirdo. I love it. Cre- oh, she's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, 
fantastic. Yeah. And you meet her too, and she's like super normal. Uh-huh. She's really smart. Mm-hmm. She's very articulate. Mm-hmm. She's very like meticulous. And then you're but, like, like, wow, the, all these things, all that shit through. in your brain is <laughs> yeah. like, what? It was the awesome. Fuck? Yeah. Um, but yeah, this was a, a part of a series uh, called Under the Bed for <clears throat> for Pure Taboo. Uh, they did. Uh, all I mean I think that they weren't all for pure taboo but they were there was a series that a few you know different mm-hmm. directors got together to make up this Halloween special you mm-hmm. know um and the one that Brie directed was with me and Angela White Tommy Pistol Isaiah Maxwell Steve Holmes and uh shit which one am I missing Charles Dara mm. of course Charles Dare. Charles. Can't miss Charles. Can't miss Charles. <laughs> um, it was about a uh, a couple, me and Tommy Pistol, who desperately wanted to conceive a child, mm-hmm. and and uh, you know it gets stressful and and crazy, and and at this point, my character is willing to do anything it takes to just get pregnant, mm-hmm. um, and so I to, so I go to this questionable doctor who's doing experiments and tests, you know, and and it's free. And she's guaranteed to like get you pregnant if you mm-hmm. go to her. So I go to her, and she, Angela, just plays the most amazing, you know, mad scientist mm-hmm. character who, who gets me pregnant by making me have sex with all these weird, like, you know, projects that she's created. Oh my god! That's to get fantastic. pregnant, yeah, it was crazy and creepy and and hot and weird and all those things. And, and yeah, it's, it just got released today um, on Adult Time, and I I highly recommend watching it <laughs> that like that plays into that whole breeding fetish yeah which is a really which I don't really interesting I don't really fetish. have that fetish but yeah. during the filming of it I was like this is like weirdly hot like yeah. I enjoyed filming it yeah um so yeah. and though for those of you who don't know like the breeding fetish is literally trying to get somebody pregnant yeah which is <laughs> I mean the consequences of such a thing or like I don't know if that's sexy, but for so I don't know. It, I think it taps think into this kind of lizard brain mentality where we're all programmed. Yeah, to want to get to, to get to pregnant, procreate, to yeah, procreate, right. Um, but I think it's like I understand it, like from a from a male's perspective to yeah. like put your like spawn inside yeah. of someone and it grows in and them, duplicate like duplicate yourself. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, yeah. like it's creepy it's like and infiltrating. Hot. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, damn, like, can you imagine being a baby that came from a breeding fetish? Like, (laughs) (laughs) who knows? Maybe we were. You know what? I I definitely was. I came from a Mormon family. That's the whole point. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, they just sugarcoated it a little bit more. (laughs) It's for God. I think it makes it even more weird. You're, You're breeding servants for God. Which is what having kids in the Mormon church is oh about. Oh my God, I never thought about it yeah. in that way. So that's what I was born to be. How am I doing? You're, you're doing great. <laughs> you're doing great. You're, wow. He thinks is that re- Is that really what they say? You're, bre- you're making servants yeah, for God, God? Yeah, God, that's why he commanded, you know, go forth and 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 have babies. I can't remember. There's so like there's an actual Bible verse can, about it, but it, it's, me. yeah, yeah. It's that's we're, a little we're all, narcissistic. Exactly. And that's like <laughs> he teaches and like the Mormon church is all about like not being narcissistic and being humble and, and giving your life to God. I'm like, but this God you're, you know, worshiping is everything that he's telling you not to be. Right. Like, I don't know. It's, it's crazy. Do you have any kind of faith or do you have like a different idea of God or do you have spirituality <clears throat> in your life? I'm, I'm atheist. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and I don't really, I'm so, I had so much of that growing up that mm-hmm. I'm just over it. I don't even care for any of that, any of it. Yeah. And w- once you look into religion, um, it's all religions come from the same, uh, story. You know, I, I can't recall what it was now, but it, if you start researching it, you find that all religions stem from this one that started at the beginning that was just some, like, bullshit. I think it was, like, in Egypt or something, like, mm-hmm. some story they told. And people were like, oh, this would make a great, you know, lifestyle. It's a good lifestyle. way to the people. <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, I guess it explains things that don't make any sense. I mean, can you, you can imagine, like, before science, mm-hmm. like, the natural disasters that we witness, like how do you explain that crazy shit? Mm. So I guess it kind of makes sense. And then also too, I think to give people like purpose and give people direction maybe. I know, but to me that's kind of 
pathetic. I'm yeah. like, you can't just find that within yourself. You need to rely on, on this, you know. Right. Well, I think today, obviously, with science, like, we we know why volcanoes erupt. And yeah. We know why tornadoes We know why happen. the moon disappears once a month. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But you can see, like, I mean, I am not religious at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but I could see why, you know, explanations had to be created mm-hmm. for those kinds of things. Yeah. It, it, what it comes down to, like you said, is just control. It's just mm-hmm. another way to... To make money and to control people. I mean, the Mormon church is a like multi billion dollar. Yeah. All religion. you have to do is like drive on Santa Monica, like Santa Monica and Overland, and there's a fucking Overland, the Overland church, the Mormon church with its huge spire. It's, have you seen it? The what? The, is, there, is there, is there, there's a huge Mormon church. It's a temple then. Churches are temple. small. Yeah, they have temples oh, all over. See, see <laughs> different. I was actually raised atheist, so I like, I'm, literally know nothing about a temple church <laughs> castle yeah i think i've th- I whatever think I've temple high there. rise it's all the same but, <laughs> but yeah I, I i did like baptisms for the dead when i was younger in the mormon church like wow. all the weird like temple culty type yeah you know experiences and rituals like it's it's fucking wild yeah <laughs> But do you have like, okay, so religion aside, because you don't have to be religious to have like any kind of spirituality. Do you have anything like that? Or do you ever like wonder or like why we're on this planet? Or do you ever like not re- think I about- don't, I don't really care. I don't really stress about- You're just more in the moment. I, what I just, well, I mean, not that I'm in the moment. I just, to me, I am atheist. Mm-hmm. But even if there was something after this, I don't believe that any religion on this earth has it right. Mm-hmm. Like there's no fucking way because even the, even the Mormon church has evolved so much and- and what it believes comes after. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just want to be a good person, you know? And even if there is like a heaven or a hell, I'm just going to be a good person just because I feel like that's the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, when I die, if that's, if there is a heaven and hell, I believe that that's going to be the only defining factor mm-hmm. to get in or not. And right. so then I'm just not worried about it. Yeah. Cause like, I, I know that I'm a good person and I do my best and and that's to me that's all there is to it. Like yeah. you should do that regardless and right. then if you there is something then cool. You're afraid of yeah. going to heaven or hell. And right. that's one thing about atheists versus people who are religious that I respect about atheists is that mm-hmm. they're a, they're good people just to fucking be good people. I mean, mm-hmm. the ones everyone's good and bad in, in right. each group, but people who are atheists who are good people, I respect infinitely more than religious people who are good because, you know, I'm like, you're just being good because you want to go to heaven. Right. Like you're, There's you're no, just being good authentic. because, yeah, it's not, you're, you're just being good because you're afraid to go to hell. Right. You're just like being good to be like, Hey God, did you see that? Did you see? I just gave that homeless person some money. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not real. I also think too, like if you really want to like think deeply about it, I personally don't believe that there's a hell because mm. I don't think that even like really bad people, I mean, if God is really all powerful, then didn't he make you bad? Or, you know, people like, because like we talked about earlier, like you're a product of like so many different things, mm-hmm. genetics, you know, biology, mm-hmm. life experiences, so if you grew up in a horrible family and you were abused and you were tortured or whatever, like that, that's not your fault yeah. and that created you to be something. Yeah. Or if you, you know, and some people are just have certain personality traits or they're mentally ill. Like, how is that? Does that mean that they deserve to go to hell? Right. Yeah. Like, how is After it, God designed them that way and God put them into a family that would raise them that right. way. Like, it's. It just like, it kind of. And, and then people in religion and then the Mormon church particularly particularly they use the excuse like oh well god gave us free agency and that's you know where the people are the ones doing that not him mm-hmm. and i'm like well then why couldn't he come up with a fucking better plan like <laughs> <laughs> if he's this all powerful being like this is the best he could do is a plan right. where innocent people get her and like it's just bullshit to me i'm like yeah if that's like what your god's best plan was and a plan where people get hurt, people get killed and people get tortured for what fucking reason? Like, because he wanted us to have free agency, then he's kind of a shitty planner. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) He's a shitty planner. (laughs) Like you're an all all powerful being and that's the best you can do. Yeah. So yeah, I hear you. Like, I just don't believe it. Like either he's not real or he's doing a shit job. Right. (laughs) Oh God, maybe I will go to hell. (laughs) 
No, I don't think so. I mean, you know, yeah. Like, I don't know. It's just one of those things you could like argue about and think about forever. And everybody's got their, everybody's got their own belief and, you know, whatever, whatever makes you happy and whatever helps you get through the day. Like, I'm just like, believe whatever you want, as long as you don't push it on other people. Yeah. And see, that's like another thing. Like, I love my family, but you know, it is still a weird thing to me that they are they all are Mormon and that's just how they're going to be. And, mm-hmm. and I have to accept them and they have to accept me. And, and we, and, and we all get along, but when it comes down to it, you know, people say like, Oh, well, you know, people should just be able to do whatever they want as long as they're not hurting people. But people in the Mormon church are hurting people, mm-hmm. you know, they're tearing families apart. Mm-hmm. You know, I was lucky to be in a family that wouldn't do that. But if you're teaching, if the teachings in the church are telling you like, Oh, if you're, if your son is gay, he's going to hell. Right. You know, how that family's going to get as far away from that as they can. Right. You right. know, so they are hurting people. So it's not okay. And I don't support it. And I, it's, it is hard for me to, you know, like I love my family and they're not always like talking about more, like how they're Mormon and church. Like that's, mm-hmm. you know, my family's not, cause there are people in the church who, who are way more, like I said, there's different levels of, of it. Um, mm-hmm. But I couldn't be around people who are constantly like pushing it and talking about it and making it their their everyday right. you know, routine right. to to preach it to everyone around you because it's it's just bullshit and it's yeah. and it is hurting people and <sighs> I hear you girl. <laughs> I totally hear so you. I so it's like no I'm not just gonna be happy for them that they're that they're happy like you know people in the Mormon church or other religions that are that are hurting people mm-hmm. um and I mean this is a big reason why I did Bishop's interview that scene for pure taboo mm-hmm. did you ever Mm-mm. so I this is like a whole <laughs> yeah I actually heard a really okay so I think I know like in general what you're talking about in terms of what a bishop Bishop's interview is Mm -hmm. because I listened to this whole NPR episode about it. About Bishop's interviews. Yes. Yeah. And Uh, it was, I was, I I just remember listening to it being like, oh oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. It's basically you meet with your Bishop starting at age 12 in the Mm -hmm. Mormon church. Um, At age 12, you start meeting with your Bishop twice a year, every six months um, to discuss your spiritual progress and your worthiness. Mm -hmm. Um, and to make sure you're, you know, on track and everything with your spiritual goals. And during this time, they just hound you about, you know, it's, it's, I guess, similar to a confession session Mm -hmm. um, where they make sure you're paying your tithing, 10% of all the money you get, you have to give to the church. And if you, yeah. And if you don't pay it, then you can't get your temple recommend if you can't go to the temple you know you can't go to the celestial kingdom so you're essentially buying your way into heaven how do they okay so they can't actually check that you're giving 10 percent of your earnings can they oh no they make you they'll make you show documents and if you don't show them then are you fucking serious they don't like if they feel like they need what they want your tax returns if they feel like you're lying they can ask for it and if you you can choose not to give them but in return, you just won't get your temple recommend. Wow. So, yeah, they wow. have, they will take it to that point. That's crazy. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, and the biggest sin you can commit into the church, in the church, like, you know, if you have sex, you know, if you're like, if you're in the church and you're not married and you have sex with a new guy every week and you mm-hmm. openly tell your bishop about that, you're more likely to get excommunicated than you were if you killed someone. Wow. So... Um, one of the biggest things they hound you about is your sexual purity. Mm. And, uh, so I was, I was young and I was in one of my bishops interviews. This is the last one I ever went to. I refused to go after this. Um, and I had been starting to experiment sexually. Um, and I hadn't had sex yet, but I had been fingered by someone like, you know, Mm -hmm. someone had fingered me and the bishop starts asking me about this. And I, told him and then he's like well well what tell me what happened next like you know and like just got and they go into detail and they want to hear everything and during this particular meeting I was too young to understand at the time but now that I'm an adult I look back and I realize what was going on because I felt like there was something weird going on but Mm -hmm. I didn't get it he was jerking off under his desk because I was explaining to him what had happened to me and that's all that it didn't escalate escalate from there Mm -hmm. Um, but it does in other situations and with other girls and boys in the church, you know, 
it, this is like, when is this going to stop where church leaders are abusing young kids? Like it's just, yeah. it's become a regular thing within the religious community in all religions. Right. And it's, it's just got to stop. So I, I did this scene where I, prepare Tubby, where I got to, I got to write the scene and I wrote it based off of that story only in my version. I showed the full extent of what can happen when you send your kid alone into a room mm-hmm. with a man who has that kind of authority right. in their life. Yeah. Um, and the problem is too, is when you make sex so taboo, then like people get all kinds of fucked up ideas yeah. around it. And, and I was like, their mind as well. I was lucky to know that that is wrong. You mm-hmm. know, some people, it does fuck with their head. I, it didn't with me because I knew that in that situation where I was talking about that, as soon as I left, I was angry. Mm-hmm. I thought to myself, I should not have to talk about that with him. He's mm-hmm. not my, he's not my parents. Like, mm-hmm. you know, he's not my mom or my dad. Why does he get to tell me, you know? what to do sexually. And, and I, even though I was young, I knew that that was wrong. Right. Um, I didn't walk out of there crying or guilty. And, and But a, a lot of kids do. Of course. You know, and adults. And, you know, it's wrong. And that goes back to me saying, like, you know, even if people are in the Mormon church and they're happy, I still cannot be happy for them because they are hurting people. Mm-hmm. Like, they're supporting. And it, even if they in particular are not, they're supporting a community that does. Right. So... It's just, yeah. but that was an important project to me because I got to show, you know, this is what fucking happens. And it was kind of my fuck you to the Mormon church. And, yeah. And, um, did any of your family knew that you did that scene specifically? I told, I told a couple of them. Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, um, one of my sisters was, I talked to her about it and she was like, cause back then, um, you had to send your kid in alone mm-hmm. and I, I just think that's fucked up and wrong. And I don't keep up with the new rules in the church now like I used to because I'm not in it. Mm-hmm. And I said to my sister, and she's like, oh, well, they changed that rule. Now parents go in with the kids. And I was like, oh, well, that's great. Like, yeah. I'm glad they changed it. But then I find out that she was sugarcoating that because it's not that they made a rule that parents go in with their kids. They said parents can go in with their kids. But parents still have the option to send their kids in alone. Right. So I'm like, that's that's not enough. Yeah, so. and it's also strange to have to talk about your sexual purity and in front of your parents. It's too. what? Oh, yeah. So, I, and you, you think that if my mom and dad really are really having to explain that to anybody. Yeah, do you think that if my mom and dad are sitting right next to me that at that point that I would, like, even tell them what happened? Like, yeah. It just, or, like, having to tell it in front of my parents would make it even more traumatizing. Like, so it's just, it's all kinds of fucked up. I mean, no one should be talking to kids about sex, but their parents, I mean, right. unless their parents aren't doing it, then, you know, that's where schools need to come in and do a better job. Like everyone needs to do a better job. Right, right. These days. Yeah, sex education is definitely like a big issue in mm-hmm. today's world. And even in where I lived growing up, there hardly was the sex education we got was just a class about uh, how reproduction works. Mm-hmm. But that's not necessarily that's not sex a, education. Yeah. What? It was how it works, and then don't do it. <laughs> like it's like, wait, what about STDs? What about you know, consent? What about hormones? What about yeah. like urges? Yeah, what about, exactly. Like, these thoughts and feelings that I'm having that I don't understand mm-hmm. because nobody, nobody's is explaining explaining it. it to me, and nobody's mm-hmm. telling me that this is normal for someone my age. Oh yeah, I know. I'm I, going through puberty. I mean, the person that I referred to earlier that I was in a relationship with, he also um, was raised in the church and he had also left. We had both left. Um, And he, you know, had such intense shame after masturbating that he would physically punish himself. He would like punch himself in the face. Oh my God. That's so terrible. Yeah. Because of how guilty he felt. Yeah. And whose fault is that? Yeah. (laughs) It's just crazy to me because it's like, I grew up in such a different environment. You know, I grew up like my parents made porn and I grew up in a very like free spirited, like. Cannot even imagine what the. I can't imagine. Here here we both are though. (laughs) Here we are. Both in porn. Yeah. I I just can't imagine growing up in that kind of environment, you know, and sometimes people say like, oh, what was it like growing up like a child of pornographers? I'm like, I I don't know. They were just good parents. Yeah. Like they didn't. 
you know, they, I knew wow, that, how mind blowing people yeah. in the industry can be good parents. I know. <laughs> I know. Right. We're just normal people. What? <laughs> I know. I do. <laughs> I do have some people who, um, you know, work in the industry who have kids, um, who have come to me and asked me like what it was like growing up, you know, having mm-hmm. parents who worked in the industry mm-hmm. and like, was it okay for me? And what did my parents say to me and stuff like that? And, you know, I just knew my parents were always honest about it, but they weren't like, here is what we do. Yeah. Look at this porno. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? You like they never showed it. it to me. They yeah. kept it away from me because I was too young. But um, I just, you know, knew that mom and dad made, you know, movies and pictures for grownups yeah. and, and I wasn't it. allowed to go in the office and. And that was kind of it. And mm-hmm. I didn't really care. Well, I mean, it's just like teaching that. our kids that they can't watch rated R movies until they're older. You right. know, it's like, yeah, you just teach them, you know, some things are not appropriate till you're older. And yeah, you can, you know, talk about it at different stages as, as they grow. Yeah, exactly. It's simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know. Hopefully people, I feel like people are becoming, we're talking, starting to talk about this stuff more. I mean, especially now that like porn is out there and it's out there on the internet and now like mm-hmm. kids are watching porn and that's becoming sex education, which is a problem because it needs to not come from Pornhub. Mm-hmm. It needs to come from the parents and the schools. Yeah. So hopefully we'll be seeing some changes. That's happening. what like parents that bitch about it. I'm like, you can't say anything until you've talked to your kids yourself. Like yeah. if your kids are seeking it out, that's because you're not doing a good job. Right. So, yeah, because kids are curious. They're mm-hmm. going to, you know, and they're I, mean, I, re- I remember and, like Googling like the word orgasm. I'm like, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like looking up all this stuff. And I just like did it right there at the computer. And when I was younger, like. I can't imagine because the Internet didn't come around until I was, you know, in my like late, <clears throat> late teens, like going into college. So mm-hmm. I can't imagine what it would be like growing up with it. It's got to be nuts. Mm-hmm. I just had my mom's penthouse magazines in the back that I used to steal. <laughs> <laughs> all right well alina thank you so much for coming in this thank was such you. a pleasure and um really like interesting i love like your backstory and i love you know how you provide a completely different account than what most people think it is to be somebody working in the sex industry and from the background that you come from and and yeah i just think you're i just think you're swell thank you i think you're <laughs> swell as well <laughs> Can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media and if you have any websites or anything that you want to plug? Uh, yeah, uh, my website is newly launched. I have, uh, you can order customs on there and merchandise is coming soon. Um, it's it's Selena Lopez dot com. Mm-hmm. Um, and my Twitter is at it's Selena Lopez and my Instagram is at it's Selena Lopez official. Fantastic. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. I'm also on Snapchat at Holly Randall 78. If you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. Um, help me s- help support my trip to Vegas in 2020. I will be streaming my podcast um, from the adult time booth. So I'm very excited about that. I'll be that. signing there. Yay! <laughs> So we will be at the adult time booth. You can come by and say hello. And also too, um, I have a channel on adult time. Holly Randall and filtered is officially on adult time. So you can go um, check me out there as well. All right, guys. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.